Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Coffee with Ken. I'm Ken Bibri, a managing director at Savills, a leading tenant advisory commercial real estate firm. We are in week 33 of social distancing as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and only seven days away from the 2020 elections. In the news today, Amy Coney Barrett was sworn in last night as an associate justice to the United States Supreme Court. Hospitals across the country are reporting a flood of new COVID-19 uh, patients. Today's topic is Teaching America during a pandemic, and we're joined by the CEO of Teach for America, Elisa Villanueva Beard, EVB. Is that what they call you? Is that, is that easier? A good portion call me EVB. Yeah, <laughs> it's great to be here with you, Ken. Thanks for oh, having me. <laughs> well, it's, it's so good to see you. Um, it was funny, when I was prepping for this, I thought back about a, an old political uh, experience I had. I worked on a campaign in 2004, and it was like my first presidential campaign. I'm 24. And uh, my roommate at the time, I used to wake up at like six in the morning, and I would make a lot of noise and open up the lights, and I would always yell, and say, this is not a school board race. This is like a race for the future of the free world. And I would just do that every day. And this person <laughs> was our political director. So one day, she, you know, she buzzed me and she's like, can you come to my office? And I went in there and it was the head of the school board for like Miami-Dade. And she was like, she wants to know why the sign is here. And she looked at me and she said, every race is a school board race. And from that day on, I was always like, you know what, you're right. So we're, we're excited to have you. And uh, I know you're working hard every day on these issues. So um, thank you. Yeah. And then we would love to get a kind of quick take from you. I mean, you know, I'm sure as an organization, you are always planning and strategizing. And I'm sure in January of this year, your, your plans may have been on one track and then obviously the pandemic hits. So why don't you give us a quick lay of the land with the last, you know, nine months have been like for you and your team with your planning and what track you were on and where you are now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, you know, at Teach for America, we've been around for 30 years now. And uh, right. those of you that are not familiar, you know, we know that educational inequity is a systemic issue and it requires lots of different interventions in order to make the kind of progress um, that delivers on the promise we make to kids, kids, which is that they will be able to learn, lead, and grow in this rapidly changing world. And um, the contribution Teach for America makes is leadership. We go support, train, exceptional and diverse leadership to come into this work. Um, our folks teach in low-income, urban, and rural America for at least two years. Um, and that sets them off on a commitment to working towards educational equity and excellence for the rest of their lives. Um, they are, we have now a network that's 65,000 strong. They're teachers, they're principals, system leaders, social entrepreneurs, politicians, working in the medical profession, you know, the justice system, because they know that change is needed and inside and outside of education drive change. And eight in 10 actually either stay in education or have a career serving a low-income community, which is incredible because eight and 10 had no intention of going into education before they met the kids. So anyway, that's what we've been up to for 30 years. And, you know, Ken, we had just finished this big strategy process where we, you know, stepped all the way back. We're 30 years old. You know, what has changed? What are our assets, liabilities? What, ha you know, how do we respond to this changing world? Um, and we anchored in a big 10-year goal for priorities. And I was literally in the process of figuring out how we're scoping the change you know, what we're prioritizing first, COVID happened. And we just pulled our strategy all the way forward. And what has happened is we have just fully leaned into it. Um, the only affirming part of all this is that we, we, are, we have the right strategy because it's all the things we knew we had to do. But we just had to do them a lot faster. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's helpful to give you an example of our summer training that was like- Yeah, I would love to hear. I mean, okay. I find this so fascinating, right? It's like everyone expects like teachers to be in person and all this, and I mean, talk about a community of professionals that this is really the hardest to navigate and get through. I mean, I'd love to have that insight. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, the first question we very practically had to ask ourselves was, you know, should we bring in a core in for, the, for this next fall? Um, and we already had, it, you know, people accepted into the core, but the reason we were asking that question is because we train our teachers in person summer school training we teach students and we have this you know incredible ecosystem of support for our teachers um, and that wasn't going to be available to us and so we then had to go talk to principals and system leaders and commissioners of education and ask do you all want our teachers understanding that they're not actually going to teach kids this summer um, which is so core to our model and you know all of them said 100% Elisa, we need your teachers now more than ever. 
um, to be able to make the moment. And so that, so we said our communities need us. We're going to double down and go. What it meant is we had to create a fundamentally different curriculum. So we had mm -hmm. nine weeks to create a virtual summer training and a standardized one. So before this, we had a bunch of different summer trainings running. So now we were saying we're going to run one and mm -hmm. it wasn't a, nat a national effort or re it was like a TFA effort. We put our best people on the case, regional, national folks to do this and we executed on it. It was four weeks and two days. Um, we saw amongst the highest results we've seen in a decade and we had percent less. And so there was so much learning that came from that. Our staff, which, you know, 40% of, of our full-time staff staff the summer training, which is not the way we do this. We usually use part-time staff. Um, there's a lot to learn there. They, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, they stepped up and, you know, very long hours while having to manage children and, you know, all the things that, you know, human beings are managing right now that are really overwhelming. And so I'm in awe by our staff. I'm in awe by our core members who just want to have the greatest impact and went all in their energy, their commitment, you know, to be part of the solution and the change and to really taking care of, you know, their whole schools and being in, in partnership with other teachers has, has been amazing to be a part of. So, so if I'm not missing, you're in around 37 states right now. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like you have a unique perspective in understanding all of your teachers in all of these communities and how they've had to adapt and react and how every state hasn't necessarily approached the response to COVID in the same way. And from the beginning, this has clearly been a situation where it's been really left to the jurisdictions, to the states and localities to address COVID in a non-uniform way. And we continue to read about certain school districts opening or closing or virtual right. or not and so on. T tell us, like, how has that been for you and, and, and just kind of, you know, the core members, right? Like, how were, what are you hearing from them on the ground about who's handling it well, who's not, how do they address it, how are you dealing with them? You know, just kind of give me a lay of the land about just what you've been able to kind of crowdsource about America's reaction and, and how it's impacting education. Yeah. You know, um, Ken, it is, it is the most difficult thing that I have ever felt and experienced. I've been in education for 22 years, and I, I cannot emphasize enough the loss and the suffering happening in our low-income communities. You know, every, every person, I think we all know people who have lost their job, have personally, you know, lost or had someone suffer from COVID-19. We have all these, you know, natural disasters happening. We have a racial reckoning in our in our midst at the same time. Um, and what we observe is the the, I mean, it's a fact that people being most disproportionately impacted by all of these things are kids of color growing up in low income communities and communities of color generally in in these communities. And I I just think that is we we have to really understand the implications of that and the implications what studies are telling us already is we're literally on a path to leave an entire generation behind you know kids are starting school with a full year of loss learning loss and this is on top of already kids growing up in low-income communities don't have the access and opportunities and many are not on grade level coming into school and so on top of that they're further behind not to mention all the social and emotional wellness that has cared for in this moment that's what's impacting teachers, right? I mean, I, I, I every week work to talk to teachers, principal system leaders to, to see what's on their mind. And um, I'm in awe by educators who are literally playing 3D chess right now um, in trying to make these decisions with the best of their ability, grounded in research and data and, you know, um, and doing their very best. Um, but it's it's incredibly difficult. And the truth is, our systems don't have the capabilities and the capacity to just hit it like this on average. You do have exceptions, you know, when you have hero teachers and principals, I can sit here and tell you many stories of principals that just, you know, got devices for their kids in two weeks and ensured that every kid was online and made contact with every parent and, you know, ensured every kid had food, chased their kid families around until they found their families. I mean, I have endless stories of teachers and principals within our network doing that. But, you know, we need a system systematic approach to meeting the moment um, and, I, I think that that's the clear eyedness that we need to be thinking about. And the, the opportunity is the system before COVID-19 
was not working for many, many kids, right? We were leaving many kids behind. To give you a sense of it, 50% of kids growing up in our lowest income communities were graduating from high school. That's compared to 96% of kids growing up in the most affluent communities. And only 6% of those kids that were graduating from high school made it to and through college. What we also know is that potential is distributed equally across all lines of difference, but access and opportunity is not. So this is the moment where we can say, let's center equity in the conversation and figure out once and for all, how do we properly take on this problem? Um, and, and that's what we're focused on. And that's what our network's focused on alongside many others who you know, have the same interests, but it's our choice to make right now to not allow an entire generation to be left behind because the impact of this will be one of a lifetime. We've been doing these coffee talks for so long, I feel like, since the pandemic began that it, it strikes me. We had one, an early conversation was with John King, the former Secretary of Education, CEO yeah. of the Education Trust. And, you know, it was like April. And he was already kind of foreshadowing a lot of this, like COVID as an accelerant, access to broadband. A lot of these families and these young people, their parents are probably essential workers and they're not even going to be home. So let alone making sure they're on Zoom, having the technology, they're kind of left there. That's right. He was kind of choreographing that how much time some of these most at risk communities uh, would be without education, thinking about them being in person in the fall. Now they're not in person and what this is going to potentially do to drop out rates, et cetera. So you as Teach for America have worked for 30 years to try to improve, make tangible and, and measurable improvements in these areas. How far backward is this going to you know, put us, especially our vulnerable communities and, and education across the country? I mean, like size up the, the, the impact that this is the magnitude of this, because I feel like it's really one of the things that's not getting enough attention to your point. Yeah. I mean, Ken, it's devastating. I mean, imagine uh, an entire generation not having the, 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 their learning needs met, but also just them as, as, as people. So when I think about what can we be focused on, right? Because I'm, a, I'm an action oriented person. Like what, what can we be doing? The future is very grim and let's do something different. And I, I, want, I, want, I always stay centered on the fact that it is arrogant to think we know what the future is gonna do, right? We, can, we get to choose a different possibility. And this is the moment where all of us can lean in. You know, there, I, 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 there are no good things coming out of COVID except this should be a national conversation now. Yes. We're not talking about it, the presidential debates, education is not the thing, but without education, mm -hmm. we know we can't find the path forward for a stronger economy, a stronger country, a, a society that, you know, allows every person to fully contribute, national, you know, security, et cetera. So we know we have to double down here. So I would say, number one, we need to make sure that the basic needs of kids are being made, met, you know, like that we're really wrapping our arms around what do kids need from a wellness perspective, whether it's food, housing, like we need trauma-informed teaching and engagement. We need empathy for families and for students. And, and these are all like, you know, and, 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 and alongside that, of course, we need to address the academics, but they have to be dual approaches and realities. Yeah. And not until we meet the basic needs can we start having the conversation of where are our kids? What interventions do they need? How do we aggressively go after those interventions? And that, that's one piece. The second is what you said about the digital divide. I mean, we've started school again this fall. We still have 15 to 16 million children who do not have access to devices or broadband. Literally, there is no infrastructure in certain places to have access. And that's like basic, right? I mean, the need, we've been talking about the digital divide for decades and now it's in our, it's front and center and we can do something about it. Like you guys, once and for all, let's solve this problem because this isn't a temporary thing. Oh, once COVID is over, now we don't need digital devices. We're already leaving kids behind because they don't have access to technology. This is a part of learning period for going forward. And so we've got to really figure out how to address it. And not just to get the devices, so fine, I have a device, but then what, right? Te teachers need to be trained on how to properly use technology, the development around that, which we're not seeing happen. Even for districts who made a decision back in June that they were gonna go virtual through you know, the rest of the calendar year, no investment in teacher development. What do we expect to happen? Yeah. You know, What do we expect to happen? So that's a big thing. And then the last thing I'll say here is, 
funding and resources. Um, we are in a many crises right now, and you know, there's just a need for greater investment from the federal government, I would say. Like the emergency funding that we have received for education for this pandemic isn't enough. It's five times less than what was invested in the last recession. Um, and our current situation is much worse. Our schools, our students, our educators need more investment. And you know, when we look at under resourced communities, marginalized communities, the truth of the matter is that on average, US school districts serving the largest populations of black, Latino kids, native kids, kids of color, receive roughly $1,800 less per student in state and local funding than those who serve, you know, the fewest students of color. And they're the kids that need the most, you know, like we just talked about what they're experiencing firsthand. And so we just need to be clear eyed about where do we need to invest to make sure we're bringing all kids, because we all as Americans care about all of our kids to have an equal shot in life. And um, this investment is, is, is very much needed. I just want to drill down on that because this is not an urban issue, right? This is very much also a rural issue, right? Like when we think about the country, this is like, this is not a, a locality challenge. This is a federal infrastructure, digital access, technological problem that really at the core of it, is something we can solve is a logistical yes. issue. It's like feeding kids, right? Like we have this call with Billy Shore, who you know found it share our strength. I mean, right? There's not an issue of having enough food in America, right? There's, there's plenty of it, right? But there's millions of kids and young people who are hungry every day, but who rely on schools to access that food, who rely on the logistics of distribution, right? So these are challenges that we should be able to come together uh, and kind of address. Let's let's drill down a little bit about what what a, a day in the life of a, a TFA teacher looks like today and, and what is that going to look like moving forward, right? I think we, so many of the conversations I have with business owners on the real estate side, you know, we spend most of the summer planning, like what is return to the office going to look like? And like all of that's done, right? Mm -hmm. Like everyone's kind of punted to the next year. And like, it's not even something we're talking about now. It's really more about what is the future of your space going to look like? Cause we're not even planning to, to come back in the, in the near term. Right. So what's happening with school, like there's no date for all the schools to be back, right? There's no vaccine numbers are going up. This is kind of going to be something that exists for, for the near term, right? So how are your, you know, teachers, how are, you, how are core members reacting? What do you think the future is of, of education? I know there's a lot there, but just kind of how are you thinking about the future the next 12, 18, 24 months? Yeah. Um, you know, our, one of the things that I, 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 I started saying maybe a year ago or 12, 18 months ago was, you know, we have to learn how to stand powerfully in the face of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And it's a skill that most of us don't have and our students need, you know? And so what teachers are facing is like a need to adapt constantly. I mean, you know, my, my husband also oversees schools and school principals. And, you know, yesterday he was on the phone all night, you know, because a student had COVID-19, they're trying to figure out, did it spread, whatever. So now they're shutting down for, you know, two weeks. And, and this is what you're watching everywhere, you know? So it's like, it's it's flip flopping, um, and and it's it's devastating every moment that we're watching it because what we know is that the virtual learning works for very few kids. Like it really is not effective, even when you have the best of circumstances. Say in my household, um, my husband and I are former educators. We were both part of the TFA core, um, and we have four sons: twelve, ten, eight, and six. And you know, we, they have what they need and we couldn't ensure they were getting, you know, proper anything um, during the spring when, you know, this was all happening. And so in the best of circumstances, it just really doesn't work. And so, um, but then, you know, we have to ensure that we're prioritizing the safety of students and educators as we go back. And we do know what's best for kids is that they get back in classrooms, but of course we have to do it safely and we need to, you know, preserve the community and ensure that that we're able to, to do this responsibly. Um, so I think what that, I mean, what are, what we're doing for our teachers is really trying to figure out how do we support their mental and just their own wellness. So they're able to support their own students wellness because it sounds soft, Ken, and I don't know what people think when they hear that, but people are the stressors that are happening in people's lives are unbelievable. And the, us, that they're having to manage isolated and then having to show up for kids and then what our kids are going through, being able to hold our kids through that. And so, you know, um, 
workshops around resilience and stress resilience and how to do all of that. I mean, that has just gone, we, we've known we needed to do that, but that's just front and center. The generosity of prioritization and just like, what are the things that matter the most and how do we give people just less pressure to breathe and able to take care of themselves? And then of course, supporting them to be effective in classrooms, right? Academically. And so we have a bunch of, um, you know, we have a platform that we're using and we're coaching online and putting, you know, codifying best practices and all of those things are things that we're of course doing and teachers are just having to adapt so we're trying to use the strength of our network to wrap our arms around our educators so that they're able to wrap, wrap around their students and, and then help whole communities you know we're we're there to to be part of the community solution and and work in partnership with others and i think the future of education i don't know you know some folks are working to reinvent, like this is the moment, let's reinvent what schools look like and you know, what is a 21st century relevant education mean? I think our kids are gonna not put up with going back to what was there. Um, so I just wish that we could create more space for leaders to, to, to dream up what could that be, but the pressure of today you know, is really tough for folks to, you know, think about a new way of doing the work. We're trying to make, we are making space for that for educators and leaders who are, are ready for that and have the capacity to do that. Um, I'd like to see more of that to, to try to fuel that kind of momentum. Yeah, just, just talk a little bit about that. Like, so how do you try to carve out your time organizationally to address this kind of flood of challenges, right? Like these millions of young people that are, are falling behind and you're trying to stop like that collapse and make sure mental health and wellness of, of your teachers are kind of monitored but at the same time how are you trying to keep you know part of your time and attention focused to like the future like actually innovating capturing and not missing yes. this opportunity and time maybe to kind of shake things up a little bit where there may not have been an opportunity right like one of the things we always talk about on these these talks is just not only how COVID's an accelerant but like is it potentially also a silver lining somehow through all of this chaos to address some really systemic deep challenges that maybe would have just continued to putter along for a decade or decades to come is now a time to kind of capture that. So how do you manage and, and also kind of devote maybe, you know, 10 or 20% of your time to kind of saying, okay, I need to carve out and think about like, you know, your recruitment, expansion, growth, attention, uh, you know, right. information, so, um, crowdsourcing, whatever. Yeah. Right. Um, two years ago, I, I made a very good decision, <laughs> which was I decided to stand up the systems lab is what it's called. Um, it is a systems impact lab. And essentially, there's two parts of it. One part is really studying the conditions that are leading to the biggest systemic changes. And so what are the levers? And because we have, you know, such a breadth of communities you work with urban, rural, you know, all parts of the country, you're able to sort of start to see patterns. So there's a part of the lab that's focused on that to help with as an experiment of learning around what's happening and, and, and how to take those practices and think about, is it relevant in my local context, et cetera. There's another part of the lab that's focused on the future of learning. So um, through this moment, um, we had this funder who said, you know, there's nodes of incredible ideas that are already exist out there, but mm -hmm. they are not being highlighted and they don't have sort of a learning community or network that allows, you know, that to gain momentum. And so um, we've been able to invest in bringing these networks together where, um, first of all, we're able to think about what solutions we invest in, which, you know, we don't invest dollars in, in, in anything, but this funder said, are there ideas out there that if you like a little bit of, of capital will allow them to sort of actually bring their ideas to life? And in return, we just want their learning and we want them to be able to share what they're doing, what they're learning, what's their, what's their vision, how's it going, um, and create a community around that. And so we were able to bring students. So we center students and all of this and families and their, their needs. Um, they're the closest to what is most relevant and what, what the problems are and what the solutions are um, that have helped us figure out where do we invest um, and what do we learn from that? And so we've now made, you know, tens of thousands of dollars of investments that are creating this network of learning. I don't know where that's going to lead, but we do yeah. have big ideas. Um, we're getting a bit of fuel and, and we're at least going to see what we, what we're able to do with this network that then touches others and the exponential sort of, you know, impact of that. And so that's one thing we're doing. And then we have um, partnerships that we are working on 
that are that are helping school leaders think about the future of learning. And if I were going to run a school with that in mind, what are the principles, the tenants? How would I set up a school like sure. there are no longer bells, there's no walls? And so just trying to imagine what that is and spurring our folks to do that. We have 3,000 principals and assistant principals at Teach for America right now. And so, you know, we have a group of alums who want to be on the, on the you know, front end of that. And a lot of others are working on this. So it's a, a matter of helping people get the access to the time, the capacity, the resources to be able to dream into that. And so we're also investing in that at the moment, which I think is really okay. Uh, are you seeing, I mean, I know for, for our family, we, we have, you know, two boys, uh, seven and four, and we have uh, very much increased our appreciation of, of educators and teachers. Are you seeing this kind of, uh, you know, positive uh, kind of feeling uh, toward, you know, teachers and being on the front line? And, and how is that appreciation kind of benefiting, you know, Teach for America? Are you seeing an increase in, you know, potential applicants for, you know, positions? How are you kind of capitalizing on kind of this growing sense of appreciation and respect for teaching as a profession, but also highlighting the, the deep need and uh, challenge that exists. Yes. And kind of yes. Using it as a, as a tool to grow, you know, your own organization. Mm -hmm. This is, I mean, if there's a silver lining, Ken, it's like that people know how hard teaching is and how we just need our, you know, our, our, our educators are truly heroes and we need to invest in them. And we need to get, you know, top leaders to come into education because you know it is it, it, it is a science and uh, you know and of course it's a craft as well but we just it's it's it is still the hardest job i've had my three years of teaching in the classroom and so i'm i am grateful for the appreciation that most americans have had because they're having to sit in the driver's seat and say oh my gosh like this is actually a really difficult thing um you know barely qualified to run recess i mean it's like it's a <laughs> Exactly. Um, you know, we, I don't know how it's going to play out for the recruitment season yet. We're managing a few things, you know, um, it's still very hard to be part of the education system. And, and you know, we, we go after mostly recent college graduates who really want to have a systemic impact, want to be part of something that really is going to drive change. Um, and so it's it's not always the easiest sell to say yeah I will we the, our, our pitch is gosh the first system you get to change is your classroom and that helps propel you get close to the problem have an immediate impact it's ground zero for seeing all the inequities kids are up against but then you see the opportunity of what kids can do and then that sort of fuels you into the, your future to pursue change in, in, in whichever way you want um, and so there is definitely this generation is so committed and wanting to drive change and be part of the solution. Um, we're also having to manage though like budget cuts, right? I mean, we're going to see budget cuts across the country, um, which means that there will probably be furloughs. There will probably be not, you know, first year teachers not hired. And so we're having to manage that risk and ourselves manage who we're able to bring, how the numbers of who we're able to bring. PFA is 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 huge is is greatly uh, is is greater than what we're able to provide at the moment. But these are the things that we're working through to figure out how to responsibly, um, you know, bring the next generation of core members in, into the work. But um, we will have a powerful group that that is able to join us next fall. So, how are the teachers that are in the classroom today? How are, how are they doing? How have they been adapting? Are they optimistic? Do they feel like things uh, are, are getting back to normal at all? What what are you hearing from folks on the ground? I mean, your kids are back now for a few weeks, right, in, in Texas? Yeah, well, in my in my community, they've been back in person for four weeks. And it, you know, another school, another district just opened up full time on Monday. So they're, it, you know, slowly and surely um, getting on. I would say our teachers are on fire. Um, you know, I think that we're grounded in the fact that in 10 years, you know, our friends are, you know, future children, grandchildren, you know, nephews, aunts are going to be asking, what did you do? in this greatest disruption in American education, the racial reckoning happening, the, you know, the COVID-19, what did you do? And we all need to have good answers for that. And I think people are really centered on, I wanna be part of the solution. And when you join this work, when you're in classrooms, you are part of the solution. Um, and so uh, we're, we're seeing folks just, you know, adapt, persist. Um, and I often talk about crucible moments, help us figure what we're made of you know this is when we figure out what are our yeah. values what are our strengths um and and you get this toughness about you um because you get broken down and you get built back up and that's what's happening 
in classrooms today because, because of the world around us. And I think at the end, we'll all end up stronger, better leaders centered on what we care about and what matters most. And I've just been having coffee. Like, I feel like I need to, to be doing more. But on that note, of this, uh, uh, so incredible uh, to, to have you on today. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, Teachforamerica.org to everyone who's tuning in today. Go check it out. Get involved. Spread the word. Uh, and, and share a great appreciation that we have for, for educators. And, and let's not be short-sighted about the, the real challenges you're dealing with every single day. Um, so thank you for, for participating Thanks so much, today. Ken. Thanks for all um, you do. Uh, no, no, this has been a lot of fun. Um, and everyone tuning in, thank you for tuning in. Um, again, teachforamerica.org. Make sure you check it out. Uh, next week, we have two episodes of Coffee with Ken. Uh, the first is on Wednesday, November 4th. We have Betsy Fisher-Martin, who was the former executive producer of Meet the Press. And we're going to rehash what happened the night before which would have been election night. And on Thursday, November 5th, David uh, Rubenstein, the co-founder uh, and chairman of Carlisle Group. So please practice social distancing, wash your hands, wear a mask, and don't forget to vote. Thanks so much, Lisa. Good to see you. Thank you, Ken. Take care.